The JUS2 report comprises 10 individual reports about the different aspects of dry eye. Our subcommittee looked at the epidemiology of dry eye disease, so who gets it and what causes it. Symptomatic dry eye disease generally occurs more often in women, those with an Asian background, contact lens wearers and older individuals. We also looked at the economic cost of disease, such as that associated with treatment, and found that particularly indirect costs due to decreased work productivity made up the majority of costs. Future studies should target how common dry eye is in populations not currently studied, such as in the Southern Hemisphere, in young adults and children, and look at the effects of new risk factors such as digital device usage. What is now needed is to translate this research into clinical trials to determine the optimal combination of these biomarkers and to develop these into point-of-care testing that can be used in the clinic. The TFOS Juice 2 pathophysiology report highlighted that the majority of dry eye disease is evaporative water loss, leading to hyperosmolar tissue damage. This is largely a result of inadequate lipid production by the lipid-producing glands of the eyelids, the meibomian glands. T hyperosmolarity can initiate an inflammatory cascade at the ocular surface, leading to ocular surface damage tear film instability and further amplifying that hyperosmolar environment. Studies need to help us understand factors such as the etiology of my Birmingham gland dysfunction and the triggers of ocular surface inflammation. A really important feature of dry eye disease is that it's more common in women than it is in men and we think that this is due to the influence of sex hormones including estrogen and androgen but also due to other hormones such as those that regulate thyroid metabolism and glucose metabolism and also due to epigenetics. In addition, women are much more likely to access care for dry eye disease than are men. But we need further research to better understand these relationships between sex, gender and hormones. So maintaining stability of the tear film is critical for preventing dry eye disease. Instability manifests in many ways, including changes to osmolarity, tear film evaporation, and also the profile of lipids and proteins in the tear film. We've begun to learn quite a lot about these things in recent years, but more work's necessary if we're going to design effective treatments.